Praise the Lord. I welcome every one of you once again in Jesus' name. And I pray that the word that comes will be of benefit to everyone. Will revive everyone. Refresh everyone. And do good in every life in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen now. Yeah. Father, we thank you for your people. Thank you for our leaders. Thank you for their faithfulness. Thank you for their willingness to serve you. We're asking, Lord, that none of us will lose our rewards in Jesus' name. As we're serving you, helping other people, lifting other people, developing other people, we pray, oh Lord, everything that concerns each of us, you will perfect in Jesus' name. Be with us tonight. Lead us into the depths of the revelation of the word of God. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you. You can sit down. We're coming to Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. I'm reading from verse 8. For finding fault of them, he said, Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continued not in my covenant and I regarded them not says the Lord for days of the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days says the Lord I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people I know tonight we studied repentance but we have not really finished in our understanding of what we learned last week many people do not understand the value of the new covenant because they do not understand what the old covenant had to offer we need to understand the past so as to appreciate and appropriate the present ours is a more glorious testament a more glorious covenant but we need to understand that the old covenant was glorious the lord does not want us to think about the old covenant as a scrap of paper as a worthless document as a useless agreement as something that was not well thought well planned well provided for and so what do you expect it was just for a time and then it was thrown away Let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, we're reading from verse 10. 2 Corinthians 3, reading from verse 10. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect, by, by reason of the glory that excels is comparing the two covenants now and is saying that the old covenant at glory it was made glorious but the glory faded into almost nothingness because of the glory of the new covenant that excels look at verse 11 for if that which is done away was glorious so don't think of the old covenant as well it's scrapped it's nullified it's annulled it's cancelled abolished because it was worthless no not at all it says that which is done away was glorious much more 
that which remains is glorious is telling us that the new covenant is more glorious and then in verse 12 seeing then that we have such hope we use plainness of speech we come to verse 15 but even now even unto this day when moses is rich the veil is upon their hearts that is when the jewish people read the old testament and they reach the provisions of the old covenant there's a veil on their hearts it's veiled they can't understand and many people too in the church many people in the new testament church they do not understand the value and the worth and the essence and the significance of the old covenant it's like there's a veil on their heart nevertheless in verse 16 when it shall return to the lord the veil shall be taken away now the lord is that spirit and where the spirit of the lord is tell me there's liberty that means there's liberation, emancipation, deliverance, freedom. And then it says in verse 18, But we all, with open face, beholding in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The question we want to ask is, did the people in the old covenant know anything about the new about christ did they enjoy anything from christ did they see did they experience did they have did they possess anything from christ what was the experience there are many people that will talk as if in the old testament there was no faith that's not right Hebrews 11 talks about faith and Hebrews 11 is talking about the old covenant people and it said by faith, by faith, by faith of course they had faith and then there are people that think they didn't have grace they didn't have conversion they didn't have repentance as we talk about repentance there are many people that will think what a pity for those old covenant people there's no repentance what do you say that they had repentance did they have forgiveness did they have deliverance did they have the conversion that leads to righteousness did they enjoy healing did they enjoy deliverance did they enjoy the power and the gifts of the spirit of god how about holiness how about sanctification how about the supernatural manifestation how about getting to heaven did any of them get to heaven at all you see many people do not understand and they think that all this is we are talking about is only for the new testament believers let's see the involvement of christ with them we're looking at first corinthians chapter 10. first corinthians chapter 10 i'm reading from verse 4. first corinthians chapter 10 verse 4 and did all drink the same spiritual drink talking about the old covenant people for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them and tell me the rest that rock was christ of course he provided the water for them he provided the spiritual meal for them he provided all those things for them he was active but veiled he was active but hidden he was active but he wasn't seen in the physical in fact uh, you come to first peter first peter chapter one and here we're reading from verse 11 first peter chapter one verse 11 searching what or what manner of time the spirit of christ which was in them did signify those prophets of the old covenant the spirit they had was the spirit of christ they were looking forward to christ's coming we are looking back towards calvary they were looking forward towards calvary say this way before christ paid the whole price 
the almighty God knew he was coming to pay the whole price and so he gave the blessings to the old covenant people on credit you can have it now Christ the final lamb Christ the perfect lamb Christ the perfect mediator he is coming he'll pay for it you can have peace on credit you can have the forgiveness on credit and you can have all the possibilities of what we're going to look at today you can have them because christ was the rock that followed after them and it says over here in verse 11 the spirit of christ was in them this signify when he testified beforehand the sufferings of christ and the glory that should follow let's come to second peter chapter 1 second peter chapter 1 we're reading from verse 21 in second peter chapter 1 verse 21 for the prophecy came not in old time this is the old testament now by the will of man but holy men of god spake pastors as they were moved by who by the holy ghost and so you understand all those old testament people old testament prophets they were not people that just walked in the natural the holy ghost was in them and the holy ghost spoke through them tonight we're looking at the message the past benefits from a glorious testament the past benefits from a glorious testament why are we looking at this if the saints under the old covenant experienced and enjoyed all these blessings how much more the new covenant says if those people in the olden time people under the old covenant if they enjoyed all this how much more the suffers who are here today three points we're looking at number one the conversion and the salvation of old testament sinners old testament sinners did they get saved of course what they transformed of course what they converted of course what kind of conversion did they have what kind of salvation did they have Let's look at the word of God. Is the salvation, the conversion based on repentance? Ezekiel, reading from chapter 18. Ezekiel chapter 18, reading from verse 30. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 30. It tells us here in verse 30, Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, everyone according to his way says the lord look at this now repent and turn yourselves from all your transgressions so iniquity shall not be your ruin old testament people sinners he told them he said repent and turn away from all your sins verse 31 cast away from you all your transgressions whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit for why will ye die o house of israel but start it you for i have no pleasure in the death of him that died says the lord what's that talking about that's second peter chapter 3 verse 9 god is not willing that anybody should perish but he wants everyone to come to repentance those old testament sinners had the same privilege and the same opportunity because he says i have no pleasure in the days of him that died says the lord god wherefore turn yourselves and leave ye isn't that what happened to nineveh look at jonah jonah chapter 3 in jonah chapter 3 here we're reading from verse 5 jonah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 5 when jonah went to nineveh and he preached the word and the preaching was just like a one sentence message yet 40 days and nineveh shall be overthrown and yet when the people heard 
they repented. Repentance is not just starting today, not just starting in Matthew chapter 4, verse 17. Look at this. It says in Jonah chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God and proclaimed the fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them even to the least of them for the word came unto the king of Nineveh and he rose from his throne and he laid his robe from him and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes and he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles saying let man let neither man nor beast herd nor flock taste anything let them not feed nor drink water but let man and beast be covered or sackcloth and cry mightily unto god and let them do what let them do what I'm still waiting for you. Let them do what? Turn everyone from his evil way. What's the one word for that? That's repentance. Let them turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Look up here for a moment. You know, there are people that think that those so covenant people, they couldn't approach God for salvation themselves. For repent for even if they repented, we think they needed a high priest to come. We think they needed somebody to come and slaughter animal and to apply the blood that if the priest was not there, they could never be saved. They could never be forgiven. If the high priest stayed in uh, Jerusalem or anywhere, none of those people could be saved. That's not true. You see, even Jonah was not here helping them and there was no priest here helping them. All the Lord needed was that they will turn. They will turn. They turn from their ways of sin and have faith in the mercy of the Lord. The same thing today. Anyone, anywhere. You don't need a high priest physically to come to you. You don't need anybody physically to come. Let them turn from the error of their ways. Look at verse 10. And God saw their works that they turned from their evil way and God repented of the evil that he had uh, that he had said that he will do unto them and he did it not and he did it not that mercy is still available today i said the mercy is still available today uh, you know there are people when they think about the old testament people conversion salvation or say yes they were pardoned in a way but god just like uh, covered their sin he didn't forgive them totally he didn't cleanse them totally the sin was still there the sin was still hanging on them that's not true micah chapter 7 old testament people the kind of conversion they had and the kind of salvation they had micah chapter 7 verse 18 who is a god like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage he retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in tell me mercy through his mercy we in the new covenant now were saved and it was the same mercy that saved them at that time look at verse 19 he will turn again he will have compassion upon us old testament people he will subdue our iniquities and thou will cast how many of their sins all their sins were in the depths of the sea you can tell the kind of forgiveness they had he cast their sins in the depths of the sea isaiah chapter 1 reading from verse 16 isaiah chapter 1 reading from verse 16 here the lord was telling those under the old covenant he told them in verse 16, wash you, 
make you clean which away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes cease to do evil that's repentance that's repentance stop the evil stop the sinning and stop the transgression and learn to do well seek judgment relieve the oppressed judge the fatherless please for the widows look at this come now a priest is not involved here come now high priest is not involved here come now you don't have to kill an animal just come just come come the way you are and if you come the way you are, I am going to forgive you. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Everyone had the opportunity. And the prophets told them, you can come, you can come. You can come to the Lord and all your sins will be forgiven. Isaiah chapter 55 isaiah chapter 55 reading from verse 6 you see the lord made it so simple for them and there's nothing complicated here and uh, they could come and everyone today can also come and as we come the mercy of god is available look at chapter 55 isaiah chapter 55 verse 6 seek ye the lord while he may be found call ye upon him while he's near you see you can find him now that's what he was telling them and he's very near you now you can call upon him now what do they do how do they get the mercy of god how do they get the forgiveness of god let the wicked forsake his way and the righteous man is thoughts and let him return unto the lord and they will have mercy upon him and to our god for he will abundantly pardon you see they were not uh, you know having to wait for anybody having to wait for you know slaughtering animal yes they had the day of atonement that was a national ceremony and they had the high priest there that will go into the holy of holies once a year that was uh, you know their ceremony but as for forgiveness as for salvation as for reconciliation with god they were told they could come anytime let's come to psalm 51 in psalm 51 you know this very well but the point is this you see nathan came to tell david that watch the man you have sinned you've done evil by the way nathan was not an high priest nathan was not a priest he didn't kill any animal and as um, david said i have sinned right there the lord told nathan tell him your sins are forgiven you will not die what kind of prayer did he pray remember there's no mediation here of animal sacrifice or ceremony or anything uh, psalm 51 i'm reading from verse 1 have mercy upon me O god according to thy loving kindness according to the multitude of the tender mercies blot out my transgressions don't just cover them blot them out cleanse them erase them it says wash me thoroughly from my iniquity cleanse me from my sin look up here for a moment he wasn't asking nathan okay you be the intermediary between me and god go and ask god he will cleanse me he prayed by himself old covenant and the same thing happens today now that christ has sacrificed his blood you really need to look for somebody somewhere i need forgiveness uh, can you be the intermediary christ go to god directly through christ and this is what they did even in the old covenant for i acknowledge my transgressions my sin is ever before me against thee the only have i seen and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest behold i was shaped on iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me behold thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom purge me you see that purge me he was praying by himself and he could have 
this forgiveness and this cleansing purge me and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow it says make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice hide thy face from my sins and blot out how many iniquities all my iniquities look at this now verse 10 creating me a clean heart O God renew a right spirit within me cast me not away from thy presence take not thy tell me Holy Spirit from me restore to me what's that restore to me what's that the joy of salvation is not talking of salvation from the philistines it's not talking of deliverance from enemies it's talking about iniquity it's talking about sin it's talking about transgression and it says cleanse my sin that's what we have today convert my soul that's what we have today change my life that's what we have today and then when i have that salvation i have the joy of salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit look at this look at this verse 13 then will i teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall tell me be converted there was conversion there was conversion old testament people had conversion and those people knew i must be right with god i must have salvation i must have the joy of salvation and then only after that i will talk to the sinners and those sinners shall be converted unto you let's come to psalm 103 psalm 103 we're reading from verse 1 bless the lord O my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name bless the lord O my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives this man had assurance assurance there's assurance of salvation and here without any priest without any high priest without animal without blood without anything faith in god Faith in the mercy of God, faith in the grace of God, and it says, uh, Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. What happened to the transgression, to the sinner? Look at verse 12. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west and you cannot even see the east from the west or the west from the sea so far as he removed our transgressions away from us how did they have that habakkuk chapter 2 habakkuk chapter 2 and here we're reading from verse 4 habakkuk chapter 2 Verse 4, you know, the people that say, you know, those Old Testament people, they didn't have genuine righteousness. They only had self-righteousness, filled their hearts. That's not true. There were people that had filled their hearts. There were people that had self-righteousness. But there were people that got their righteousness by faith. Look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. Behold, a soul which is lifted up is not upright in him. But, read that for me. But say it aloud. This New Testament faith, it says, the just shall live by faith. Was that something very new that you know Habakkuk just discovered? No, it was there from Genesis. Look at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15. We're reading from verse 6. The kind of salvation they had. And the kind of forgiveness they had. And the kind of conversion they had. Genesis chapter 15 verse 6. He believed in the Lord. And he counted it to him for righteousness. That's not self-righteousness. He believed in the Lord. That the Lord will forgive. The Lord will cleanse. The Lord will have mercy. The Lord will show his grace. He believed that. And the Lord counted that to him for righteousness after they were saved 
what kind of life were they expected to live after they were forgiven what kind of life were they expected to live some four look at some four in the psalms some four were looking at verse three psalm four were looking at verse three but know that the lord has set apart him that is godly for himself him that is forgiven him that is righteous him that have been counted righteous by faith in god it says god has set him apart for himself the lord will hear when i call unto him standing up and seeing not in the old testament stand in awe and see not commune with your own heart upon your bed and be still some 119 119 in the psalms look at verse 1 blessed are the undefiled in the way who walk in the law of the lord blessed are they that keep his testimonies and that seek him with the whole heart they also do no iniquity they walk in his ways old testament believers after they were forgiven after they were cleansed after they were converted after they had at the first initial a uh, work of grace in them which is reconciliation with god now they do know iniquity and they walk in the lord what kind of prayer were they to be praying after they had got that initial experience of salvation and the kind of life they were supposed to be living look at Hosea chapter 10 Hosea chapter 10, we're reading from verse 12. Hosea chapter 10, reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, Suit yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and reign, what? Righteousness upon us. This righteousness that comes from heaven, like the rain comes from heaven this one is not self-righteousness you see all those uh, books that people write all those books that people read and they say well you know righteousness in the old testament mm, righteousness the self-righteousness and you could not take them to heaven that was the work of their not at all not at all it is righteousness that god gave them when they believed on the lord and when they were saved and it says they sought the lord they prayed to the lord on until he came and ranged righteousness upon them the conversion and the salvation of old testament sinners the point is this if the provision of redemption in the past dispensation was so glorious ours in the present dispensation is fuller is richer is greater it's more glorious believers under the new covenant cannot lay below the standard of the old covenant beneficiaries were they converted and cleaner we should be converted and cleaner were they forgiven and free we should be forgiven and freer were they washed and made white which we, sh we should be washed and whiter than snow were they righteous and holy we should be righteous and holier were they blessed and full full of the blessings of god we should be blessed and fuller were they transformed and good we should be transparent and better were they uncompromising and bold we should be uncompromising and bolder point number two now the consecration and sanctification of obedience trusting saints the consecration and the sanctification of obedience trusting saints we're looking at these old testament people the people the patriarchs their princes we're looking at their priesthood we're looking at the people that lived under the old covenant and the question is were they consecrated to god were they submissive to god were they totally completely unreservedly yielded unto god were they sanctified at all 
I don't mean every one of them. I don't mean as a nation. I don't mean as a block. I mean individuals that saw the promises of God and they held on to those promises. Let's look at them. Hebrews chapter 11. We're reading from verse 8. Consecration. They are consecration. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're reading from verse 8. Here in verse 8, it says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, he obeyed and he went out, not knowing whither he went. That's consecration. He responded to the Lord. He responded to the voice and the word of the Lord. The Lord called him, come out. Where am I going? No question. What will happen when I get there? No question. And he just followed and was walking a step at a time, a step at a time. That's consecration. Look at verse 17. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, God didn't tell him, Abraham, don't worry about this. I'm testing you. There's nothing to this. It's just a trial. I know what I'm going to do. He didn't tell him that. It was just tried. He offered up Isaac. And he that received the promises offered up his only begotten son. Consecration. He had been waiting for that child from the age of 75. And he had the child at age 100. After having the child a few years later, Ishmael was driven out. Hagar was driven out. These were the only child now remaining. And these were the fulfillment of the promise of many years. And God said, go sacrifice him to me. If you were, what would you have thought? New Testament, New Covenant. But here is old covenant person. And then it says, he offered up his only son. Of whom it was said that in Isaac shall thy seed be, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in a figure. That's consecration, that's sanctification. We're looking at uh, chapter 11 of Hebrews, we're looking at verse 24. Verse 24, it says, By faith, Moses. When he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He gave that up. What did Paul the Apostle say? The things that were gained to me, I counted as loss. And I count them as dung, as dross. What's that? Consecration. About Moses, the things that were gained unto him. Because if he was accounted as the son of Pharaoh's daughter, because Pharaoh did not have a son at that time, Moses will now replace, uh, you know, that son, and he would reign as a king over Egypt. He said, no, I'm not an Egyptian, and I'm not going to change my nationality. I remain an Israelite. Look at verse 25. So, uh, choosing to suffer. The affliction, suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, of a sin for a season. He said, I'll rather suffer than enjoy the pleasures of sin. That's consecration. That's voluntary, by the way. Nobody compelled him. Nobody forced that on him. Look at verse 26. Esteeming the reproach of who? I said the reproach of who? They were looking forward to when Christ will come. And if Christ were here, I will give up everything for him. I will deny myself of everything. But Christ is still to come in the future. And it is like they were looking ahead, just like we're looking back to the coming of Christ. And the reproach he was suffering, he knew, is the reproach of the coming Christ. It says, choosing to suffer affliction with the people of God for a season, and uh, to uh, enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. For he had, he had respect unto the recompense of the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt 
not fearing the wrath of the king and he endured a seen him who is invisible that's consecration that's consecration you see those people if the adamic nature were there the adamic nature will be pulling them down you can't go that far you can't go that high you can't commit all that they committed everything old covenant the point is if god helped them to do this under the old covenant how much more today hebrews chapter 11 we're reading from verse 5 Hebrews 11 verse 5 by faith Enoch was translated that he should not see death and he was not found because God had translated him for before his translation he had this testimony that he pleased God he pleased God what does that mean he was like reflecting the nature of Christ here is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And Enoch was looking ahead when Christ will come. He'll please the Father completely and totally without any reservation and without any interruption. And he for 300 years walked with God. And the word of God says he was translated because of this kind of life that he lived which pleased god by coming to exodus chapter 32 exodus chapter 32 and i'm reading from verse 10 exodus chapter 32 we're reading from verse 10 in exodus chapter 32 verse 10 here we find moses talking to god after god has spoken to him what he wanted to do exodus chapter 32 verse 10 now therefore let me alone that my wrath may wax hot against them and that i may consume them and i will make of thee a great nation there was nobody there was him just moses and god and joshua was at a distance and god said moses you know what I'm changing my plan. I'm going to destroy all these millions of Israelites, but I have now, my affection is now for you. My concentration is now for you. And what I wanted to do with all those children of Israel, you are the one Moses I'm going to do that with. If the man was not sanctified, if the man was not consecrated, if the man was not totally yielded to the Lord, what will happen? That looks like a good plan. There are even a pain on my neck. All these Israelites, they murmur and murmur every time. And they are thorn in my side. And you have decided you want to wipe them out and start with me. Wonderful. Then it will be the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, and the God of Moses. That's a good idea. But no. For a sanctified man and for a consecrated man look at what happened in verse 11 and moses besought the lord is god and said lord why does thy wrath wax hot against thy people which thou hast brought forth out of the land of egypt with great power and a might and with a mighty hand wherefore should the egyptians speak and say for mischief he did he bring them out to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people remember abraham isaac and, and israel thy servants whom thou swearest by thine own self and said unto them i will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and all this land that i have spoken of will i give unto your seed and they shall inherit it forever and the lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people can you see sanctification there yes i see there can you see consecration there yes i see there he rejected he refused he said no lord you will not start with me and make me a mighty nation stay with the people and continue with the people 
what's our attitude when maybe the members of our local church they are not uh, you know doing well and all that and then we'll say we're not going to allow them to give you stress or distress or conflict we're not going to allow them to give you a potential we're going to remove you out of that place the the terrible bunch and you know they are incorrigible and they are terrible and all that we're transforming you to a better place you know the, the average pastor will say thank you very much that's uh, that I can be free from those uh, from that bunch, wonderful but not Moses, Moses said God have mercy on them and don't replace them with me, look at verse 31 and Moses returned unto the Lord and said oh these people have sinned a great sin and have made them gods of gold now yet now if thou will forgive their sin he couldn't complete the sentence if not blot me i pray thee out of thy book which thou hast written blot me i pray thee out of the book of life if you will not forgive them if you will not take them to be your people i forfeit my relationship with you what's that isn't that the same thing with paul when paul the apostle said i could wish that i myself were a cause for the children of israel if that will save them you see these old testament people there were those of them that knew sanctification is available and they got it consecration is necessary and they consecrated themselves no doubt there were old testament saints who were fully consecrated to god and entirely sanctified by god with less knowledge and less revelation they were consecrated and they were sanctified with less privileges and less provision because now Calvary is in place. And those people had less privileges than we have. Less provision that, than we have. And yet, with the little provision of the old covenant, they were consecrated and sanctified with less opportunities and assistance. We have a greater assistance today. We have greater opportunities today. And yet, with what they had, they were consecrated and sanctified with less exhortation and and encouragement less exhortation and encouragement there wasn't a bible believing church in every corner a bible believing church in every city at that time and even though they didn't have the privilege of teaching and preaching every time yet there were those of them who were consecrated and sanctified and with less civilization and advantages civilization what i mean by that is you know with civilization there's electricity there's a good road and also there is a law and order there is police there's security to some extent and the civilization gives us advantage at that time if, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, if uh, Nebuchadnezzar decided he wanted to burn uh, anyone that would not worship idol, wanted to burn them in fire, that was all right for him. Nobody to check him because civilization was not like this at that time. And yet they were consecrated to God. With all their less advantages and privileges, they were obedient to God and they were sanctified and they were holy and they were uncompromising and they were pure and they were heavenly minded when you think about those people at that time was so much opposition and persecution Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego still retained their consecration their sanctification and with trial and temptation Joseph you can tell still retained the consecration and the sanctification and was so much hatred and hostility Jeremiah still retained the consecration the sanctification with apostasy and hardness of heart among the children of Israel Ezekiel still retained the consecration and the sanctification and with so much corruption and defilement Elijah still retained the consecration and the sanctification with so much adversity and accusation Job still retained the consecration and the sanctification with all things around them these old testament says were still consecrated they were still obedient they were still sanctified they were still steadfast they were still holy they were still pure 
was still undefiled. It was still heavenly minded. We have a better covenant. What excuse do we have? If those people with all the challenges around them could so give everything to God and could so devote all their time, all their person, everything they knew unto God, how much more the people of today we can do better. We will rise higher. We will go deeper. And all the excuses that anybody might have been making before, all those excuses are, are taken away in Jesus' name. Give me a good, good amen. amen. Point number three now, the confirmation of supernatural operation by the Spirit. The confirmation of supernatural operation by the Spirit. You see, he was spoken about their conversion and their salvation. It was available to them. And some of them made use of the privilege. He was spoken about their consecration and sanctification. All that was available to them. And some of them took that privilege. I about the confirmation of supernatural operation by the Holy Ghost, by the Spirit. We're coming to Second Samuel. Second Samuel chapter 23. Second Samuel chapter 23. And I'm reading from verse 2. Second Samuel chapter 23. And here we're reading from verse 2. Look at verse 2. The Spirit of the Lord speak by me. His word was in my tongue. Here is David saying, I have the experience of the Spirit of God. From the time of salvation, from the time of conversion, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. And then he went on, he consecrated himself. The Holy Spirit was still present, abiding. And now he said, the Spirit of the Lord spake by me. And his word was in my tongue. Micah chapter 3. Micah chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 8 Micah chapter 3 verse 8 truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord I am full of power Old Testament prophet Old Testament preacher and Old Testament person but truly I am full of power by the spirit of the Lord and of judgment and of might to declare unto Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. There are so many people I can refer to, but I've chosen three of them in the old covenant. And I've chosen them to show you how they were full of the Spirit of God. And if they were full of the Spirit of God, we have no excuse. We have no excuse. Nobody helped them. Nobody laid hands on them. And nobody helped them to get the fullness of power you will be full. You'll be saturated. And deal with the power of the Holy Ghost in Jesus' name. If these people in the old covenant, under the old covenant, if they had the abundance and the oppression of the Spirit of God in their lives, thank God you will. I said, thank God you will. Number one, Elijah. Number two, Elisha. Number three, Ezekiel. Number one, Elijah's exploits. Elijah's exploits. We're reading from First Kings chapter 17. First Kings chapter 17. I'm reading from verse 1. First Kings chapter 17. Reading from verse 1, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. That man was in control, he was in charge. Although he was not the king, the king did not have as much power and authority as that man had. He was in control of the whole nation. Look at verse 10. 
in verse 10 so he arose and went to Zarephath and when he came to the gate of the city behold the widow woman was there gathering tea of sticks and he called to her and said fetch me I pray thee a little water in a vessel that I may drink and she and as she was going to fetch it he called unto her and said bring me I pray thee a morsel of bread in thy hand and she said as the Lord thy God liveth I have not a cake but a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise and behold I'm gathering two sticks that I may go in and dress it before me and my for me and my son that we may eat it and what die and Elijah said unto her fear not and tonight I say unto you, fear not. Amen. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first, and bring it unto me, and after make for thee and for thy son. For thus says the Lord, God of Israel, the barren of meal shall not waste, neither shall the cross of oil fail, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days. And the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord, which is spake by Elijah. Look at verse 22. In verse 22, and the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, and the soul of the child came on into him again, and he revived. That child was dead. Elijah prayed, and God sent an answer, and the child got up. Old Testament, chapter 18. In chapter 18, verses 1 and 2. And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. And Elijah went and showed himself unto Ahab, and there was a soft famine in Samaria. Look at verse 7. And as Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he knew him and fell on his face and said, Art thou that my Lord Elijah? And he answered him, I am. Go tell thy Lord, behold, Elijah is here. Verse 17. In verse 17, and came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, that's boldness, the boldness of the spirit, in that thou hast forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baal. Verse 21, the people were collected together. Elijah came unto all the people and said, How long shall ye urge halt between two opinions? If God, if the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. You know the story, I'm just reminding you now, verse 30. And Elijah said unto all the people, come near unto me. And all the people came near unto him. And repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the, to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, unto whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be thy name. And the stone and with the stones he built an altar single handedly, all by himself, nobody helping him. He did that in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two measures of seed. And he put the wood in order, and he cut the bullock in pieces, and laid him on the wood, and said, Fill for barrels with water, 
and pour it on the burnt offering on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood and he said do it the second time and they did it the second time and he said do it the third time and they did it the third time and the water ran round about the altar and he filled and filled the trench with water and it came to pass at the time of the evening of the offering of the evening sacrifice that elijah the prophet came near and said lord god of abraham isaac and of israel let it be known this day that thou art god in israel and that i am thy servant and that I have done all this according to thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that these people may know that thou art the Lord God, and that thou hast turned their hearts back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell, and consumed the burnt sacrifice, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench and when all the people saw it they fell on their faces and they said everybody the lord he is the god the lord he is the god he turned the whole nation back to god single-handedly he brought revival do you know that when john the baptist uh, was said to be conceived here the only comparison the angel could make as was said by god to the house of uh, zechariah and elizabeth look at this luke chapter one in luke chapter one reading from verse 16 uh, and many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the lord their god and it shall go before him in the spirit and power of elias of elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the lord that's elijah elijah's express you can read the old, in the old testament you'll see a lot of things that happen number two elijah's expectation elijah's expectation we're coming to second kings second kings chapter two and i'm reading from verse nine second kings chapter two we're reading here from verse nine let's see how he also had the power of the spirit and if that was possible for them under the old covenant such is possible for you today it's possible for me today things are going to turn around what they urge we're going to have we're going to have more and greater will be the oppression of the spirit in your life in your ministry in jesus name second kings chapter 2 verse 9 and it came to pass when you were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion, can you say that with me? Let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. Did he receive? look at verse 14 and he took the mantle of elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said where is the lord god of elijah and when he had also smitten the waters they parted hither and thither and elijah went over and when the sons of the prophets which were to view at jericho saw him they said the spirit of elijah does rest upon elisha and they came and to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground before him now as we look at this elisha you saw his expectation What's the realization in his life? Number one, he had the ministry of healing. Chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 10. In chapter 5, verse 10, and Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go, watch in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again unto thee, 
and thou shalt be clean. Look at verse 14. In verse 14, then he went, he went he down and did himself seven times in Jordan according to the saying of the man of God and his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child put that down that's the gift of healing look at chapter 6 verse 1 chapter 6 verse 1 and the sons of the prophets said unto elijah uh, unto elisha behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us too narrow for us let us go we pray thee unto jordan and take this every man a beam and let us make a place there where we may dwell and he answered go ye and one of and one said uh, be content i pray thee and go with thy servants and he answered i will go and so as one uh, and so he went with them and when they came to jordan they caught wood but as one was felling a beam an axe fell into the water and he cried and said alas my master for it was borrowed and the man of god said where fell it and he showed him the place and he caught down his cheek and cast it hither and tell me and the iron did swim put this down the gift of walking miracles gift of walking miracles look at verse eight then the king of syria watched against israel and two counsel with his servant, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And the man of God, that's Elisha, sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there not once not twice therefore the heart of the king of syria was so troubled for this thing and he called the servants and said unto him will ye not show me which of us is for the king of israel and one of the servants said none my lord o king but tell me the name elisha the prophet that is in israel tell us the king of israel the wars that thou speakest in thy bed chamber that's the gift of the word of knowledge everything the king of syria was uh, talking about all the plans elisha knew everything number one the gift of healing number two the gift of walking miracles number three the gift of the word of knowledge we'll come to chapter 6 verse 13 verse 13 and he said go and spy where he is that i may send and fetch him and it was told him saying behold is in Dothan uh, and uh, therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and uh, a great host and uh, they came by night and compassed the city and when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth behold and host compassed the city both with horses and chariots and the servant said unto him alas my master how shall we do and he answered and he answered and he answered fear not for they that be with us are more than they that be with them and elisha prayed and said lord i pray thee open his eyes that he may see and the lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about this man had the gift of discerning of spirits the son in of spirits you know the, the young man did not see that his servant did not see that but elisha could see into the spirit realm he had the gift of the discerning of spirits look at verse 18 and when they came down to him elisha prayed 
unto the Lord and said, Smite these people, I pray thee, with blindness. And immediately the Lord smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. Look at verse 18, and it came to pass, verse 20, and it came to pass when they were come to Samaria that Elisha said, Lord, Open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. The man had the gift of faith. The gift of faith. Those people came and then they just said, Blindfold them. They were blind. And they said, I'll take you to who you want to actually see. He took them to the king of in Samaria. He had the gift of faith. Look at verse 21. And the king of Israel said unto Elijah, where when he saw them my father shall i smite them shall i smite them and he answered thou shalt not smite them wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken with thy sword and with thy bow set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master and he prepared great provision for them and when they had eaten and drunk he sent them away and they went to their master so the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel the man had the gift of the word of wisdom the word of wisdom what do we do i want to smite them destroy them say no you cannot do that give them food let them go back to their master and that was the last time they never came again those enemies will not see them again Amen. we're looking at one man elisha he had the gift of healing and the gift of working of miracles, number two. The gift of word of knowledge, number three. The gift of descent of spirits, number number four. And the gift of a face, number five. And the gift of wisdom, number six. Look at chapter seven, verse one. Chapter seven, verse one. Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord tomorrow, about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a lord on whose hand the king leaned and such and the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord were, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shall not eat thereof. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, there's a fulfillment of this prophecy now. And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. Tell me the rest. Tell me out aloud. If you are not tired, I want to hear your voice. According to the word of the Lord. Look at verse 20. So it fell out on him that is that lord on whom the king leaned uh, for the people trod upon him in the gate and he died that's the gift of prophecy you think about you know one man elisha we've seen elijah's exploits we've seen his uh, elisha's expectation uh, gift of healing gift of working of miracles and the gift of the word of knowledge and the gift of discerning of spirits and the gift of faith and the gift of the word of wisdom and the gift of prophecy there were there are nine uh, gifts of the spirit in the new testament and the, the only one not manifested with elisha is the speaking in tongues and interpretation of tongues but let's see this now we're looking at uh, chapter 13 chapter 13 second kings chapter 13 i'm reading from verse 20 second kings chapter 13 verse 20 and elisha died because a time came and it was buried and they buried him and the bands of the moabites invaded the land at the coming or in of the year and it came to pass 
as it came to pass that they were burying a man that behold despite a, ba a band of men and they cast the man that's the dead man into the sepulcher of Elisha and when the man was laid down and touched the bones of Elisha what happened if you are revived yourself say it and stood up on his feet you know that you know what that is when something happens like you're given a reward a recognition an award after you have died they call it post humorous award this miracle this is post humorous miracle the man had died this is an extra why because he said give me a double portion of the spirit as you look at the exploits of elijah and you count one two three you count up to eight and now you count all the miracles that happened in the ministry of elisha one two three up to fifteen and to make the double that it should be what is the double of eight 16 because he had 15 and then he had died now the final miracle to complete that double portion everything the lord has for you will be complete yeah. that's why this posthumous miracle took place but what i'm saying is all these people were in the old covenant and we are in the new covenant I pray that everything the Lord has promised us in the new covenant we will have, I will have, you will have, this church will have in Jesus' name. Amen. Number three, final, finally, Ezekiel's experience. Ezekiel's experience. That is experience of the Holy Spirit. Ezekiel chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 2 and the spirit of and the spirit entered into me when he spake unto me and set me on my feet and i heard him speak unto me chapter 3 verse 12 then the spirit took me up and i heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying blessed be the glory of the lord from this place look at verse 14 in verse 14 so the spirit lifted me up and took me away and i went in the heat of in the bitterness in the heat of my spirit but the hand of the lord was strong upon me that hand will be strong upon you verse 24 then the spirit entered into me and set me upon my feet and spake with me and said unto me go shut thyself within thy house chapter 11 i'm reading from verse 5 in chapter 11 verse 5 and the spirit of the lord fell upon me and said unto me speak thus says the lord does have you said oh house of israel for i know the things that come into your mind every one of them uh, god was revealing to ezekiel everything that came to the minds of those people we're looking at chapter 8 and i'm reading from verse 3 ezekiel chapter 8 verse 3 and he put forth the form of an hand and he took me by the lock of mine head and the spirit lifted me up between the earth and the he and heaven and brought me into the visions of god to jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh up toward the north where was the siege of the image of jealousy which provoked to jealousy the lord was revealing things to him by the spirit chapter 37 verse 1 and the hand of the lord was upon me and he carried me in the spirit of the lord and set me down in the midst of the valley which was full of 
bones. Look at verse 10. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceeding great army. Chapter 43. I'm reading from verse 5. Chapter 43, verse 5. So the Spirit took me up and brought me into the inner court, and behold, the glory of the Lord filled the house. As you look at the life and ministry of Ezekiel, it was all the time the Spirit came upon me. The Spirit entered into me. The Spirit lifted me up. The Spirit directed me. The Spirit showed me. He was living and laboring and ministering by the revelation of the Spirit. And it says that same revelation, that same Spirit is going to be upon you. Chapter 36 now, Ezekiel chapter 36. And I'm reading from verse 25. Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you. And ye shall be clean from all your filthiness and from all your idols will I cleanse you and a new, a new heart will I also give you and a new spirit will I put within you and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you this is yours I said this is for you I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. If the Old Testament saints had all these experiences, what do we expect for New Testament saints having better promises that is based or in the better covenant? See what those people had. Talk about conversion, the adage, Talk about salvation, they add it. Talk about consecration, they add it. Talk about sanctification, they add it. Talk about the confirmation of the oppression of the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God coming into them, revealing to them, giving them the gifts of the Spirit. If they add that in the Old Testament, you must sit up now. And you must understand, all these things are yours for the promises unto you and to your children and to them that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall come. You will not miss any part of the provision of the new covenant that the Lord has for you, has for us as a whole in Jesus' name. Now you change your perception, you change your understanding, and you turn around and you say, if they add that... I am going to have mine. What are you? I'm going to have mine. Why don't you rise up and tell the Lord tonight, tonight, I am going to have mine. Look at everything available. Look at salvation. Look at sanctification. Look at the Holy Ghost power, endowment, and look at all the gifts of the Spirit. Everything is available today. It is yours. It is yours. Remember, they add it in the old covenant. You can have them in the new covenant. Open your mouth, raise your voice to the Lord, and ask today, it is yours for the asking.